Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to United Church in Walpole. My name is Reverend Anna Flowers. It is good to be together this day on this finally sunshiny day um, as we worship God. And as always, we begin our worship with our words of welcome, which define really who we are and what we believe by how big and wide we draw our circle of love. And so those words are this, welcome to United Church in Walpole. Welcome to all who have no church home, need strength, want to follow Jesus, have doubts, or do not believe. Welcome to new visitors and old friends. Welcome to grandparents, parents, mothers, fathers, children, single and partnered people. Welcome to people of all colors, cultures, abilities, sexual orientations, and gender expressions. Welcome to old and young to believers and questioners, and welcome to all of us questioning believers. Welcome yes, to uh, everyone. Here at United Church in Walpole, we believe that whoever you are and wherever you are on life's journey, you, you are, are welcome, welcome here. here. Every day, we are reaching out and changing lives with the good, good news of God's love. Amen. 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 Well, now is the time to talk. Do not worry about ever making noise in worship. We are a community that loves and embraces all. So let's uh, rise and greet one another with signs of God's peace. And as you greet one another, let your neighbor know, are you one of those drop of the hat criers? We're going to talk about crying a little bit today. Are you a drop of the hat crier or are you one of those people who've cried like three times in your entire life? We want to hear that. And so uh, share your neighbor. Let your neighbor know, and we will uh, we will greet one another now. Because the alternative is to come to anger, which is no So the only people who are going to make fun of the cry is people who are really angry.
Good morning. My name is Brad Parsons. It's a pleasure to be here with you this morning. Please join me in the call to worship as it's printed in your bulletin. Have you ever felt washed up, brittle, worn down to the bone? Have you ever felt like hope was out of reach? If you have, then you are in the right place, for this is God's house. Hope lives here. So come, rest your weary thoughts. Let us worship holy God. This morning, for our invocation, I am going to be reading a poem written by Reverend Sarah Speed. The title is, The Answer is Yes. It's the question we ask at the end of our rope, when the storm is raging, when the monsters under the bed have introduced themselves, when everything around us seems to be on fire. It's the question we ask when hope slips through like sand in a bottle, when the mockingbird stops singing, when the news reporter leads with another mass shooting. It's the question we ask when the depression moves in, making herself at home, making a mess of it all. It's the question we ask when we're not sure if Easter will come. Will it be Lent forever? Will the sun ever rise? Will this hope lead to something? Can these bones ever live? Now please rise as you are able, in body or in spirit, and join together in singing our opening hymn, In the Bulb There is a Flower. confession, we speak honestly and are met with grace. So let us not hold back. Let us bring ourselves to this prayer, knowing that God is already running to meet us. Let us pray. Jesus of Nazareth, I confess, I forget that you know this feeling. I forget that you too have wept. I forget that you too have lost. I forget that you too have gathered at the tomb, have grieved for a friend, have felt the sting of humanity. Forgive me for all the times I place blame on you. 
Forgive me for all the times I create distance, imagining that you could never feel what I feel. Forgive me for allowing the valley of dry bones to be a sea of space between us. Pour yourself into the cracks in my heart. Bring these bones back to life. Bring me closer to you with gratitude, I pray. Friends, you could spend your whole life ignoring God, pushing God away, or trying to solve the world's problems all on your own, and God will still love you all the same. Even in our shortcomings, we are God's beloved. So hear and believe this good news. We are saved by grace through faith. We belong to God. We are not alone. Amen. I now invite all our kids to come on up and join me at the story quilt. Hi, Luke. Come on up. Come on forward. Let's gather around here. What? And Vivian said, what's the sign of God today? You will see. It's actually right in front of us right now. It's not on our story quilt. Hey, guys, how are you? Good. It's good to see the leaves here. Okay. Let's um, let's share our sacred story. Hold on, hold that thought. We're gonna share our sacred story and then I'm gonna show you what I brought, okay? So today in church, we are telling the story of Jesus raising Lazarus. And this is one of the most beautiful and really important stories that we tell as part of our sacred tradition. And we are gonna talk about the bowl in one second. So the story goes like this. Now, Jesus was out with the disciples, and suddenly somebody came up to him and said, Jesus, Jesus, your friend Lazarus, whom we know you love very much, is so sick. You know, he's the brother of Mary and Martha, who you also love very much. These are your closest friends who you love so much, and he's really sick. We're nervous he's going to die, and we need you to come right away so that you can heal him so that he doesn't die. What do you think Jesus did? Do you think he came? Trick question, he doesn't go. Oh my goodness, what? I know, right? The story gets shocking. He doesn't go. He says to his disciples, I'm going to wait because I'm going to use this moment to show you how amazing God is. And he doesn't go. He stays where he is with his other friends. And Lazarus dies. Now, finally, Jesus goes to the place where Lazarus had died, and he had already been dead for three days. And Mary and Martha, Lazarus's brother and sister, come running. They say, Jesus, you didn't come. Our feelings were so hurt. And now Lazarus is dead. He's been dead for four days. His body is already stinky. It even says that in the Bible. It's so gross. They say his, bo his body is already stinky because he's been dead. And we're so sad you didn't come. And Jesus says, don't worry. This was all part of my plan. I'm going to show you how amazing God is. But then Jesus notices just how sad everyone is. And he goes to the place where Lazarus is buried. And even though Jesus knows that he is going to do something miraculous, it was all part of his plan. Jesus does something that's really pretty amazing. He gets so sad thinking about his dear friend Lazarus. Thank you for that kiss. He gets so sad thinking about his friend Lazarus um, dying that even though he knows the end of the story, he cries and he gets really sad and he starts weeping with everyone. And it says that right there in the Bible, Jesus starts crying. Now, had Jesus lost hope? No. Did Jesus know how the story would turn out? Yes. But did Jesus still get sad and cry for Lazarus? Yeah, he did. And there's something really powerful about that. So then Jesus ends up telling everybody in the town, all right, roll away the stone on that tomb. And this is sort of like a little bit of a hint, hint, hint. This is going to happen later at Easter too, right? So he tells everybody, roll away the stone. And then he says real loud, Lazarus, come out of that cave where you're buried, even though your body's stinky, right? And what happens? 
Lazarus comes out. He comes back to life. He's alive again. He's all restored. And they take all of the burial shrouds off him, and he's back to life. And they're so, so happy about it. And Jesus, the wrappings, like a mummy, like kind of like a mummy, the wrappings that they, they take off of him. And it's Lazarus again. And it's a story that tells us just how amazing God is, that God, with God, all things are always possible. But it's also a story that helps us understand that even if we have you know, faith to move mountains, even if we have just so much trust in God's goodness and so much hope and all the good things that we're supposed to have, it's okay to still be sad because Jesus was sad too. Yes, Vivian. Now, what does this have to do with the bowl? I want to show you. All right, I'm, we're going we're gonna to move into this now. Good prompt. So I brought here what's called a weeping bowl today. Now, for those who can see, can you see, is, is this bowl full to the brim? Yeah, it is. It's actually full to the brim with water. And the reason this is called a weeping bowl is because this bowl shows us and helps us understand what it's like when we get sad or even if we get so full and so happy that it's what's called in, in scripture, our cups runneth over. And so I'm going to pour some water in this bowl. But before I do, let's think about it. What are some things that might make us really sad in this world? Yes, Vivian. I'm not going to spill water on the floor. I did bring something to catch it. But it's okay. It's going to make a mess because that's what, that's what kind of life is like sometimes. What might be really sad? What would be something that would be really sad? Oh, yeah. How about you guys? Okay, go for it. A family member dies. Absolutely. Even though we might trust that we will see them again someday and we have hope and faith and love for that, we get sad. Our cups runneth over. All right. What else might be really sad? Going broke. That's right. And even if we might trust and have faith and hope that people are going to come around and help us and that we can rely on our community, we would be really sad about that. And our cups would run over. What else might make us weep? Yeah. If one of our best friends moved to another school, that's right. And even though we would have faith and hope that we could still love them and stay in touch with them, that might make us really sad. What do you think, Luki? Let's do one more. When somebody be mean, mean to you. That's right. If somebody's being mean to you, even though we have faith and hope that we know that we are beloved children of God and that we are worthy of love, that might make us really sad. And so the bowl is kind of a represent, representation of what it's like on the inside for us when we are just filled with so much. And Jesus was like that too. You can touch the water. Yeah, you can. How about this? We can all touch the water. And while we're touching the water, let's say a prayer together. <clears throat> so come on up if you want to. We can touch this weeping water in our weeping bowl. Yeah, okay, yeah, it feels, I know, it feels good. All right, and let's say a prayer together while we, while we touch this water, okay? Let's repeat after me. Oh, pretzel pray. Okay. Dear God, thank you for weeping with us and being with us in our grief and in our hope. We love you, God. We love you, God. We love you, Jesus. We love you, Jesus. Amen. 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 All right. There's a lot of water. If you guys had more things to weep about, we could always add more. All right. Well, you guys can go down with Bart and enjoy Sunday school, and we will see you later. Yeah. Great. Creator God, 
Why is bad news so loud? In the midst of gun violence, hunger, melting ice caps, and anxiety, it often feels like suffering has a microphone. How do we hear you? How do we find you? How do we know that these bones can live? Today, we bring our raw selves into this space, asking that once more you would rush through this room like a mighty wind. Remind us that these bones can live. Speak to us in your still, small voice, and let it be loud enough to speak to the sorrow of the day. We know that good news rests in you, and we, and we know that you are here. So help us listen, not to the bad news of the day alone, but to the hope that you breathe into every word. When open hearts, with open hearts, we pray. Amen. Our first reading this morning is from Ezekiel, chapter 37, verses 1 through 14. The hand of the Lord came upon me, and he brought me out of the spirit of the Lord and set me down in the middle of a valley. It was full of bones. He led me all around them. There were many lying in the, feet, in the valley, and they were very dry. He said to me, Mortal, can these bones live? I answered, O oh Lord God, you know. Then he said to me, Prophesy to these bones and say to them, O oh dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord God to these bones, I will cause breath to you, to enter you, and you shall live, and you shall live. I will lay sinews on you and will cause flesh to come upon you and cover you with skin and put breath in you and you shall live and you shall know that I am the Lord. So I prophesied as I had been commanded and as I prophesied, suddenly there was a noise, a rattling and the bones came together, bone to its bone. I looked and there were sinews on them and flesh had come upon them and skin had covered them but there was no breath in them. Then he said to me, prophesy to the breath, prophesy mortal and say to the breath, thus says the Lord God, come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe upon these slain that they may live. I prophesied as he commanded, to, commanded me and the breath came into them and they lived and stood on their feet, a vast multitude. Then he said to me, mortal, these bones are the whole house of Israel. They say, our bones are dried up and our hope is lost. We are cut off completely. Therefore prophesy and say to them, thus said the Lord God, I am going to open your graves and bring you up from your graves, O my people. And I will bring you back to the land of Israel. And you shall know that I am the Lord when I open your graves and bring you up from your graves, O my people. I will put my spirit within you and you shall live and I will place you on your own soil Then you shall know that I, the Lord, have spoken and will act, says the Lord. May God add a blessing to the hearing of this scripture. Thank you. 
Our second reading this morning will be the entire book of John. No, just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> Chapter 11, verses 1 through 45. <laughs> now a certain man was ill, Lazarus of Bethany, the village of Mary and her sister Martha. Mary was the one who anointed the Lord and with perfume and wiped his feet with hair, with her hair. Her brother Lazarus was ill. So the sisters sent a message to Jesus, Lord, he whom you love is ill. But when Jesus heard it, he said, this illness does not lead to death. Rather, it is for God's glory, so that the Son of God may be glorified through it. Accordingly, though Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus, having, after having heard that Lazarus was ill, he stayed two days longer in the place where he was. Then after, after this, he said to, his, to the disciples, let us go to Judea, Judea again. The disciples said to him, and Jesus answered, are there not 12 hours of, but those who walk at night stumble because the light is not on, not in them. After saying this, he told them, our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep. But I, am, but I am going to awaken him. Right. Jesus, however, had been speaking about his death, but they thought that he was referring merely to sleep. Then Jesus told them plainly, Lazarus is dead. For your sake, I am glad I was not there, so that you may believe. But let us go to him. Thomas, who was called the twin, said to his few, when Jesus arrived, he found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb for four days. Now Bethany was near Jerusalem, some two miles away, and many of the Jews had come to Martha and Mary to console them about their brother. When Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went and met him, while Mary stayed at home. Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But even now I know that God will give you whatever you ask of him, Jesus said to her. Your brother will rise again, Martha said to him. I know that he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day, Jesus said to her. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Those who believe in me, even though they die, will live. And everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? She said to him, yes, Lord. I believe that you are the Messiah, the Son of God, the one coming into the world. 
When she had said this, she went back and called her sister Mary and told her privately, The teacher is here, and he is calling for you. And when she heard it, she got up quickly and went to him. Now Jesus had not yet come to the village, but was still at the place where Martha had met him. The Jews who were with her in the house, consoling her, saw Mary get up quickly and go out. They followed her because they thought that she was going to the tomb to weep there. When Mary came where Jesus was and saw him, she knelt at his feet and said to him, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. When Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who came with her also weeping, he was greatly disturbed in spirit and deeply moved. He said, where have you laid him? They said to him, Lord, come and see. Jesus began to weep. So the Jews said, see how he loved him? But some of them said, could not he who opened the eyes of the blind man have kept this man from dying? Then Jesus again, greatly disturbed, came to the tomb. It was a cave and a stone was lying against it. Jesus said, take away the stone. Martha, the sister of the dead man, said to him, Lord, already there is a stench because he has been dead four days. Jesus said to her, did I not tell you that you believe that if you believed, you would see the glory of God. So they took away the stone, and Jesus looked upward and said, Father, I thank you for having heard me. I knew that you always hear me, but I have said this for the sake of the crowd standing here so that they may believe that you sent me. When he had said this, he cried with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out! The dead man came out his hands and feet bound with strips of cloth, and his face wrapped in a cloth. Jesus said to them, Unbind him and let him go. Many of the Jews, therefore, who, therefore, who had come with Mary and had seen what Jesus did, believed in him. A word of God that is still speaking. Thank you, God. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Friends, will you please pray with me? God, I ask that you would speak through me, and as always, I would ask that you speak despite me. I pray that your word that is heard for us this day, a word of hope, a word of love, a word of faith, might be heard loud and clear in our hearts and minds, directly from you, and I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, friends, there are two main stumbling blocks, I think, that people run into when they are thinking about Christianity these days in our culture. Two main stumbling blocks that people have to come to faith. And I hear about the first one the most. The first one is how do we rationalize in our minds these things that seem so irrational? We've heard two stories today that are some of the least rational stories in our sacred story tradition. And so people run into this issue a lot. How do you rationalize the things that seem so irrational? And for a lot of folks, this is a big barrier, a big stumbling block that keeps them from joining a church or following faith. No matter how much they love the kind of things that in new lights, all kinds of deep, deep, deep soul work can be done to sort of bring our minds along with our hearts and to embrace these sacred stories in deep and new and enlightened ways. That work is out there. If you have questions about that, I'm always happy to talk about that. Sometimes we talk about that in the sermon. Sometimes we don't. Today we're not going to because I'm going to say that I feel like there has been so much work already done on that stumbling block, you know, and if you're sitting in the audience today thinking, well, that's my stumbling block, no worries, no worries, we can talk about that later, but, but that one doesn't concern me so much. But there's another stumbling block that I think we have in our Christian tradition that keeps people from jumping on board, that, that makes Christianity hard, that makes Christianity counter-cultural to what is out there in the world. And this stumbling block I want to talk about today because I don't think we talk about it enough. And I think it's so deeply important to who we are as people of faith. And that stumbling block is hope. Hope. True, deep, unapologetic hope. 
Now that might not seem like such a stumbling block. Most of us think that we're hopeful people. Most of us in the culture would say, no, I'm, I'm hopeful. We're, we're hopeful people, right? Hope is not something that has a bad word in our culture. But I think we live in a culture that has a true lack of hope. And Christianity flies in the face of that. Christianity proudly and unabashedly proclaims a hope that defies all logic. And it is countercultural if you think about it. We live in a culture where doom scrolling is a verb. People talk about doom scrolling through social media. We doom scroll. We live in a culture where statisticians have become prophets. Right Where we look at statistics and we almost, whatever seems the most statistically profit, uh, probable, it's like that is written in stone in people's minds and hearts. Our statisticians have become our modern day prophets. We live in a culture where anxiety and depression are widespread, affecting younger and younger and younger people. Now, I'm not here to say that faith is going to solve all the problems of mental health issues. Absolutely not. People need help from our medical community to help with that. But we live in a society where this is a growing trend, and I'm not sure that we've put our finger on exactly why that is we also live in a culture where more and more and more of the younger people who are coming of age where they might be thinking about having children and they're deciding not to have children, not because they themselves don't want to have children, but they don't want to bring children into this world. Now, some of folks are like, really? Is that something that's going on? I'm telling you, it's going on. I know people. I know people personally where that's the story, and they're not alone. I know many people where that is the story. It's not their own personal lifestyle decision. It's that they do not have hope for the future of our world. And into this crisis of hope, which I think we have, I think we're living in a crisis of hope. Into this crisis of hope come these two stories of a prophet and a Messiah raising the dead. Ezekiel in the Valley of Dry Bones, Jesus and his four-day dead friend Lazarus. Here come these stories. They're not just hard to rationalize, but they're hard to accept because of the unabashed hope that they demand that we have. And friends, I refuse to explain that hope away because hope is too precious a commodity. The Apostle Paul placed hope as a higher priority than even faith when he named that important list um, of what it means to follow in the way of Jesus. He said faith, hope, and love in that ascending order of importance. Hope is so crucial because when we lose hope as a people, we perish. Proverbs 29 says, without vision, the people perish. And I think that you cannot have vision for a future if you do not have hope. Or you have a vision that is a perishing vision, right? You have to have hope to keep yourself moving forward. The way Ezekiel tells his story, and I love this story, our lectionary gave us a treasure trove today with both Ezekiel and the raising of Lazarus. The way Ezekiel tells his story, it was God himself who asks him this important question. Mortal, can these bones live? He's not asking Ezekiel, mortal, is it likely that these bones will live? Is it probable that these bones will live, he's asking him, can these bones live? It's a question that is testing his hope. Reverend Danielle Schroyer writes, this is a question of not probability, but possibility. And so what does Ezekiel say to him back? He says, Lord, you know. <laughs> Which is sort of like sidestepping the question, but it, it's not because he's saying, this is you, God. Lord, you know. Now, some of you might be thinking, hope is fine and all, but I have to plan for what's likely in my life. 
not what's pie in the sky. I can't budget on hope. I can't business plan on hope. I can't make serious life decisions just based on hope. We as a society can't make big, big societal-wide political decisions just based on hope. I've got to be realistic. And sure, of course you do. We've always got a plan. We've always got to analyze the data we have on hand. We have to see the writing on the wall when it's written there. We have to take facts seriously. But before the ink is dry on any life plan that we might have, ask yourself, have I planned away all my hope? Because I think sometimes we do that. You can plan and contingency plan and contingency plan, but if there is no hope in your plan, you have just planned God out of the equation. And that to me is what these stories are all about. They're about putting God back into the equation of what might be possible. We learn in our faith that with God, all things are possible. Doesn't mean all things are probable, but it means all things are possible. And when we embrace and keep space in our plans and in our life for the possible, we have made space for God. I heard a story recently about a ministry that, um, that was developing out of a congregation that was close to a prison. Now, this congregation had first been approached and asked to begin just sort of a like a mentoring type program with the prisoners. But over time, they realized that the number one thing that these prisoners need wasn't so much the mentoring when they were inside the walls of the prison, but it was relationships and community and a place to go to and people to be connected to and hope to find when they got out. And so this pastor built up this beautiful prison ministry. And as he traveled around the country talking to people about the prison ministry, he would share the story of the raising of Lazarus and say this to people. Where would Lazarus be if nobody rolled away that stone? If Lazarus raised up, was kept trapped in his tomb of despair, if the community there didn't have the hope to think that maybe we should listen to this guy, Jesus, and just maybe something might be happening here that we have never seen before. Let's put some muscle into this. Let's gather the guys around and let's roll away the stone. And Lazarus came out. Too often in our society, we are not putting any muscle into rolling away the stone. And what can happen, we are told from this pastor who does this prison ministry, is that for far too many of these prisoners, when they come out, no matter how much they have changed behind the walls of that prison, no matter how much they have embraced Jesus behind the walls of the prison, no matter how much they have transformed themselves, people have written them off. Nobody is rolling away the stone. Nobody is ready to give them a job. Nobody is there to help them with first and last deposits on an apartment. Nobody is there to, to show them how to navigate the bus system. Nobody is there to help them move into a new future that only hope made possible for them. And so for far too many people, they stay trapped in that tomb. No matter that they are themselves raised on the inside, they are trapped in their tomb, and they end up going back to the only people who will embrace them, which are some of the people who got them in trouble in the first place. That's a societal way of making hope not be part of what's possible, of planning away hope from the equation of our lives, of planning away possibility. Because sure, not every prisoner becomes, you know, completely resurrected in their spirit, right? Many, many prisoners continue to end up committing other crimes, go back into the system. We see that story all the time. It might be probable, but it doesn't tell the story of what's possible. 
So as we think about how to apply this scripture to our own lives today, I want you to think about where in your life are you not just assuming the worst, but planning the worst? And where in your life might you need to create a little space to roll away the, uh, the stone, to create a little space for hope to be born? May you find that place. May we all find that place. And may we begin to turn the tide on our hopeless culture and continue to proudly be a people of unabashed, unashamed, pie in the sky, hope. Amen. Let's join in singing together our middle hymn. our time of worship where we lift up the prayers of our community. We're giving thanks today for these beautiful worship flowers which are giving which were given in loving memory of Grace Elizabeth Bogart, the mother and grandmother in um, Lindsay Brinkhurst's family, Lindsay's mom. We also want to celebrate happy birthdays from this week. Lori Celentano and Robin Maloney had birthdays this week. And it looks like they're out celebrating their birthdays, because I don't see them here. <laughs> but happy birthday to them. We also want to lift up prayers today uh, for Deanna's son, David, who died one week ago today. For Walter's sister in Brazil, who has lung cancer and has just been transitioned to comfort care. For Derek, who started two months of radiation on Friday for the prostate cancer that has returned and prayers for my family as we commemorated on Wednesday the one-year anniversary of Andrew, Andrew's brother's brother David's sudden death in a fire. We also want to lift up and pray today for Bart Santaro. He's downstairs taking care of our kids right now. We are so grateful for his ministry. But Bart is having a major heart surgery on Wednesday. Um, and so we want to be praying for him, especially on Wednesday. Are there other prayer requests that we want to raise in the congregation today? Alyssa. Um, a prayer for my brother-in-law, Hussein, who is being sworn in as a citizen on Tuesday. Ooh, yes. prayers of joy for Alyssa's brother-in-law, Hussein, who is being sworn in as a U.S. citizen on oh, Tuesday. On Tuesday. Congratulations. And congratulations to us for another American. Yes. Son Jeremy, um, my 
my sister in this family who passed away around Thanksgiving. Um, after many, several years of a really tough time with my sister's illness, they have taken a trip this past week, um, a much deserved trip. They went to New York City, and then they went to DC, and then they visited the Shenandoah National Park, and um, it makes us all very happy to know that they are happy. Prayers of joy for Andy and Jeremy, who lost uh, Andy's wife and Jeremy's mother around uh, Thanksgiving, but were able to take a trip this week filled with joy. Any other prayers? In oh, yes, Sarah. Um, prayers for my father, Ted, who was recently diagnosed with a rare skin cancer. Um, he has an important diagnostic appointment coming up this week. Prayers for Sarah's dad, Ted, who was diagnosed with a rare skin cancer, has a diagnostic appointment this week. Please join. Oh, sorry, Philip. I just have another prayer of joy for uh, a small girl. <laughs> A small miracle. Amen. Prayers of joy for a small miracle that his brother and sister-in-law who needed an apartment were able to find one. Amen. All right, well, let's join together in the spirit of prayer. Holy God, we give thanks this day for the beauty of your hope, for the way that you resurrect new life out of what seems so dead, dismal, and hopeless. For the way that you have worked in this world, through signs and wonders and miracles in the past and in our present life, which show us and remind us and strengthen our faith to believe that with you, all things are possible. We lift up those who need this hope through healing, through grief, through depression, through strained relationships, through joblessness, through all manner of suffering, plant within us a seed of hope that we might share with those who need it and with this whole world. We pray now with the words that you taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. Today we invite you to join in the work of our community that proclaims good news of life and love to a world full of death and sorrow. The morning offering will now be given and gratefully received. You may come forward and place your offering in the offering box, which is now at the back of the altar, uh, so mind the wires when you come up. Or you may make a gift, make, make an offering gift using your phone and the QR code found in your bulletin. If you have made your offering online, you can also use the paper online giving cards to symbolically make your gift in the box.
God, may these gifts and offerings be used to raise faith, hope, and love out of the graves of despair. In your holy name, amen. Now please rise in body and spirit and join in the singing of our closing hymn, My Life Flows On. from singing and how can we keep from hoping I want to make a couple quick announcements we are um, going to be bringing our prayer shawls to worship every week now so we have prayer shawls in the back um, if you want to take a prayer shawl home with you or give it to someone who needs a prayer shawl that's a way that we share hope and love and comfort with those who are weeping in our communities and in our lives we also have prayer squares in the back which my kids take a new one every single week and then our dog eats it i'm sorry to say but do not the prayer square the little crosses but we're going to take better care of them from now on but um but please do take them and share them and uh and share them around they're beautiful we also want to share uh that we have a workshop coming up we are doing a trans inclusion workshop um that is coming up take a look at your um your program to sign up for that. We are requesting sign-ups for that workshop because it's at my house, and so we can't have everybody and their brother. We're already about halfway full, so if you think that that's something you want to do, please be sure to sign up so that you get a spot. Youth are also invited to that as well. 
We also want to let you know that Holy Week is coming up. We're going to have all of our Sunday services here at Blackburn Hall. Next week is going to be a very special service. We're going to have a shortened like service in here. And then we're following Jesus and we're going on a palm parade just like how he did. We're going to be going to our church. So plan to kind of move next week. There's going to be like 20 minutes in here. And then wear shoes that you can walk in because we are going on a palm parade. We're going to end up at our church, which is really exciting how it's um, on where it is with the construction process. So you get a little peek into that. And then we're going to do a blessing over at our church. And then we'll come back here together. And then you can get in your cars and go. So uh, get ready. Holy Week is a big deal for us. And so we are following Jesus on the move next week. We are also then going to have a Maundy Thursday worship service with Union over at Union. Um, it's a beautiful meal. We're going to be doing that in their fellowship hall. We're all eating. We're going to be celebrating that last supper, foot washing, the whole nine yards. We want you to be part of that. And then we're going to do a beautiful Good Friday service that's going to include all of our choirs from our church, from their church, over at Union in their sanctuary, um, as well as some uh, classically trained opera singers. And there, it's going to be a seven last word service where after every single one of Jesus' seven last words, there's going to be a musical interpretation of that moment. It's incredibly powerful. You're going to want to be part of that. And then we're doing Easter here uh, where we are. So every single regular Sunday service, you don't need to worry, where is it going to know it's here? We're going to be here. Um, it's just these other services that we're going to do with our friends over at Union Congregational. I want to thank everybody who made today possible. Thank you to Jill Takis for being our hospitality lead. Thank you to uh, Nancy Kingsbury, to Shannon Leston, Greg Noble, uh, John Schoenthaler, Tom De Silva, uh, Philip Zakharowski, Barbara Tossi. Thank you to Brad Parsons for being our lay reader. And thank you to Sarah Noble for sharing your beautiful voice with us today as um, our musician. Friends, as you go from this place, may you take the possibility of what God has promised to us with you, not the probability, not the doomsday scrolling world that we live in, but the possibility, the hope that we cling to, for without it we perish, and, and God is a God of life. So friends, go from this place with that spirit of life, love in your heart, the spirit of the God who created you out of nothing. The spirit of the God who came to save you and redeem you, redeem you and plant that hope within you. And the spirit of the God who is with you every step of the way as we march forward. May it be so and amen.